now time for the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show brings you famous celebrities and amazing people from all over the world. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. So sit back and relax and enjoy the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all you need. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. You can check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash themikewagnershow. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also on Radio Public, Anchor FM, and also watch the interview on the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on YouTube and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with a wonderful gentleman who just came from Gilligan's Island talking about a manifesto. He's with um, Spectacle Films, and he's a New Yorker. And he's also with uh, Zimu Records, writer, director, producer, artist, and academic. He produced uh, The War on Kids, winner of the Best Educational Documentary Award at the New York Independent Film and Video Fest. Also produced uh, Ickland or Eichland. He'll uh, tell me more about that. Also, The War on the War on Drugs, Relax, It's Just Sex, Borth the Dog, and more. He is just a wonderfully creative person. And, of course, with the Gilligan Man- Island Manifesto, makes me want to talk about it with a little buddy, of course, here, along with the skipper, Marianne, and... Um, Professor, everybody else, the Howells. <laughs> we'll just talk about this manifesto and how it came together. So, ladies and gentlemen, from the New York area, from Gilligan's Island, in a little manifesto area, where I'm sure there's coconuts plenty, Kevin Sulling. Kevin, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your show. Not a problem. So, you have um, have a new release called Gilligan's Island Manifesto, which talks about... Um, you know, comparing with um, how Gilligan's Island uh, relates to um, the uh, the parties that you, you'd be happy to talk about. You're also president of Spectacle Films, Zimu Records. You also produce The War on Kids, Ickland, The War on the War on Drugs, Relax is Just Sex, Boris the Dog. And before we get into your works, uh, tell us how I got started. How I got started. Wow. Uh, so I, I got started, I guess, um, I, well, I always planned on, on being a writer. And uh, so it was it was just basically waiting to be done with school so I could finally start to do the things that I wanted to do. Um, and, and I'd written a whole series of short stories. And uh, I, uh, I, I was reading about this one uh, thing that, that sort of came up in, in an interview uh, with Paul McCartney, because I'm, I'm a huge Beatles fan. Oh, nice. And, and 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 yeah, huge Beatles fan. And and he had mentioned something in an interview that he that I'd never seen him you know mentioned before. And usually get, he gets asked the same questions and he gives the same answers. And you know it's it's very tiresome. But suddenly he he mentioned how he was having dinner with John Lennon, and uh, Lennon had proposed the two of them get holes drilled in their heads because Lennon had heard that it helps expand your consciousness. <laughs> Holes and, uh, drilled in heads? Oh, my goodness. That's <laughs> painful. Ouch. <laughs> so, so McCartney told Lennon, he's like, tell you what, John, you know, you get it done, and if it works out well, well, you know, then we can talk. But but <laughs> Paul had no intention of drilling a hole in his head, but John was, was dead set on, on doing this. And um, I, I, I was really curious about this, and I ended up doing a little, little bit of research, and I found out that... Um, that this was actually something that was well first it was something that was practiced you know among different cultures all over the world you know 10,000 years ago during the neolithic era and and it's this archaeological riddle why why was your ancestors my ancestors why were they drilling holes in their heads and 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 they don't they don't know but they know that they were alive when the holes were drilled and they lived many years with holes in their heads but but it's just a mystery so this doctor came up with this theory that if you drill a hole in your head, it would result in increased brain blood volume that would release to lead to, to improve brain metabolism, better mm. brain functioning. Um, so somehow Lennon heard about this and, and decided he wanted it done. And, and it was this doctor, this Dutch doctor who, who was, you know, who proposed this. And, and the doctor tested his theory by drilling a hole in his own head. Mm. And yeah, yeah. 
and and he believed it it had the desired effect it believed you know he believed that he was changed uh for the better as as a result of this and and uh he wrote about his findings and this influenced a number of students from oxford who came over to to to, to amsterdam and met with him and then they drilled holes in their heads and soon there was this whole movement of of people drilling holes in their heads in the late 60s into the into the 70s and i guess even into today uh, it's still it's still going on and uh, so I so I did this film about it was like you know perhaps this was the reason why why Neolithic man was doing it and uh, you know for for improved brain function and that and and I decided to to make a film uh, out of this research process even though I'd never made a movie before and the film became this cult classic and aired on the learning channel and you know and a whole bunch of other you know stuff and this was you know my first project out of the gate and uh, that was that was how I ended up uh, making movies. That is amazing too. And when you talk about a hole in the head, I thought that would make you holy. That's what I thought of. Uh, well, it does that too, I suppose. I guess that's <laughs> that's unavoidable. And and, and how, did, how and did that exactly uh, work very well for a lot of people? And did it actually improve? It decreased? Or what were the findings out that uh, being having a hole drilled in their heads? So I never tested it, but um, you know, so so I can't speak from firsthand experience. However. Uh, some research was done. Uh, Muskalenko, Yuri Muskalenko, this Russian uh, physiologist, had had done some studies uh, that that seemed to show that that yeah, perhaps it does uh, it does impact uh, the you know lead to to increase brain blood volume, which would lead to more oxygen and glucose to the brain and and higher, you know greater brain metabolism. You know, I, I wouldn't say it's conclusive just one study, but it, but the one study did. Yeah. Did suggest that yeah that this might actually be beneficial, and uh, new scientists, a British journal, you know, had reviewed the study and seemed to uh, believe that it it met the appropriate scientific protocols. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's it it might be beneficial. I'm not not telling people to go out and do it, but uh, one one of the people who drilled the hole in this in in their heads was actually a professor at Oxford who had Bill Clinton as a student. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. When Bill Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, you know this. Uh, yeah, his his professor. Well, not at the time. Uh, didn't have a hole in his head at that time, but but did later later drill a hole in his head. So yeah. Dr- drilling a uh, Bill Clinton uh, Hill. Oh my goodness, Monica or Hillary? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I know I'm kidding. It just makes me think of it. I'm just going off on this as well too. And of course, he sure. also had um, another one too called. You're in good health, so that's a good play on words. And just tell us about that. So, so that was the follow up after I made Hole in the Head, which was, uh, you know, uh, like I said, it was it became this cult classic, and uh, it, it's still this this sought after movie. And 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 there's there's footage in the movie of of you know that you know that that you'd expect of of people drilling you know, holes and stuff. So it's, <laughs> it is it is pretty gruesome at times. Um, you know, there's there's. Uh, but you know, you, you kind of have to see it to appreciate what what's going on. But uh, so so the follow up was was about uh, this practice called auto urine therapy, where people drink their own urine uh, for for the the supposed health benefits. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and Gandhi practiced this, and uh, uh, I mean it's widely practiced in in in, in India and 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 elsewhere. And uh, there wasn't there wasn't much controversy uh, that I expected. I you know the medical community seemed to be like yeah you know there there's you know it's urine sterile and yeah it, it can there can certainly be health benefits from it. But what what, what was interesting and, and there's actually two two medications. There's urokinase and premerol. Premerol is made from horse urine, but but urokinase is made from human urine and and uh, you know one's a heart heart medic medicine so, so there is there is actually medicine derived from urine but what what what, I, what surprised me was you know i was wondering well well how do they how do they collect the urine for urokinase and i found out how they do it um porta potties if you ever use a porta potty, oh my gosh! Actually, yes, that they, yes, yes, yes. There's, they have they have a there's a little filter where where you know where the urine you know can be collected and and uh, and yeah. So 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 so. so the, the, or or the as I or as I say, you're in, you're out. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 pretty disturbing when you think about it. And then and then a lot of you know really expensive medication in hospitals they'll collect from bedpans and and recycle it. 
<laughs> wow. So, yeah, yeah, because you only absorb maybe 20% of, of, you know, vitamins, medication, and anything you consume, most of it goes through you and, and it exits out through your urine. But uh, um, so, you know, like I said, yeah, about t- only about 20% of, of most of what you eat in terms of nutrients or medications are, are actually absorbed into the system. That is amazing, so. too. And uh, you also complete work on uh, Mr. Kevin and the cargo call about a cargo call in Vanuatu. Did I say that right? You did, Vanuatu. Some people really struggle with that. Uh, you know, my father always struggled with that, never quite got it right. But uh, but yes, Vanuatu it used to be called the New Hebrides when it was, uh, you know, a colony of both Britain and France. And uh, they got their independence in 1980, which is pretty late uh, in the game. And uh, they... Uh, uh, I, I spent I spent well I made three three long trips and spent time with this tribe there that uh, that worships America. Wow! Uh, How so? And, um, well, it's 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 a fascinating story, but uh, uh, basically uh, the islands. Uh, so so Vanuatu is an archipelago of eighty three islands, and uh, one of the islands is is the island of Tana, and um, the the British. It was so remote that the British and French both. You know, claimed it as their own, but they it was too it was too too far away for them to fight one another over it. So they ruled it jointly, uh, which uh, I mean, most colonization people think of negatively and and understandably so. But uh, but but the colonizers typically would would do things that benefited the people to some degree. For one thing, you know, just out of necessity, they would do things like develop the infrastructure of of the the, the locales that they would colonize. Um, but because of the expense of that, neither the British nor French wanted to do anything that was remotely beneficial to the people, like like develop roads and 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 build you know various you know infrastructure that would support the people. Because they're like, well, why should we build you know systems for water or anything of that nature? You know, let let the French do it. And the French for you know like let the British do it. We're not you know. So so they would you know steal the natural resources and they'd exploit the, the labor of the people, but they did nothing for them. It was. And then it got it got particularly brutal uh, over time because they sent their missionaries there, and and the missionaries would burn down villages and murder and imprison tribal chiefs to try to get them to convert to, uh, you know, their various branches of of, of religion, and um, which which was absolutely you know savage and brutal. And um, during when World War II broke out, the United States uh, had. Uh, used one of the islands, the island of Santo, as the headquarters for the operation, you know, for the theater of war in the South Pacific. Uh, so so that was how the New Hebrides was instrumental to, to fighting the Japanese. And uh, the the uh, the play, the musical South Pacific, was based on that. Um, really? Yeah, so South Pacific takes place, you know, I don't know, I don't think they ever stated explicitly, but that's about, the, the, you know, the soldiers being on the island of Santo. And uh, Bally High, they didn't even change the name, if you know the musical. Uh, that was when the Americans came, they moved all the women off the island to Bally High. So, you know, to, to prevent, you know, the soldiers from, you know, uh, you know exploiting or, you know, they, they, they're women. So that was why, you know, that it was this desirable place to go. Um, so uh, the um, but what turned out was after being, you know, just savagely brutalized by the British and French, the Americans came along with their war machine and, and everything that seemed impressive among the British and French in terms of their ships and their technology was just profoundly dwarfed by the aircraft carriers and the whole machinery that the, the Americans brought. But the most remarkable thing was the Americans lived up to all of our noblest ideals. Uh, they, they acted as if they were guests on the island. They treated all of the, you know, the, the islanders, you know, with 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 respect uh they, they recruited their labor but they 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 paid them handsomely for for their efforts mm. you know in 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 and they routinely gave everyone on the island medical care uh when they they asked the people if they wanted anything you know they said well some food would be nice and they gave them you know 50 times more food and 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 you know and and other you know materials that that they ever could have dreamed of and so uh, you know, word got around. They, they, you know, there might have been limited communication. You know, there's no, but uh, they they still knew of the atrocities that the Japanese were committing on on neighboring islands. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, word word gets out even 
you know, somehow with communication and boats and stuff. Uh, so, so they appreciated, you know, being under the the protection of Americans. And the the Japanese never made it to Vanuatu, and it was just it was, they just described the time the Americans were there as a nonstop party. It was just absolutely amazing. They were liberated. They were able to practice their traditional uh, native beliefs and practices. Um, and then the Americans left, and the British and French took over. And 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 this is like, the French had just been under occupation by the Nazis. The 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 British were bombed, you know, routinely and daily by the Nazis, and and they reinstated their their you know their, their basically you know their, their despotic regime and and control. They they outlawed all of their traditional practices again, and. Uh, um, when when the you know, before the Americans left, they they you know they couldn't take all of their tanks and supplies and everything with them, so they offered it to the British and French at ten cents on the dollar. Wow! And this is after the U.S. had just you know saved their you know their butts, uh, in, and both of them in, in in World War II, and and they said to the the Americans, yeah, I don't think so. You know, you're not going to take it back with you, and you know why should we pay ten cents on the dollar for what you're going to leave behind for free? So the Americans just drove everything into the ocean as a as a middle finger oh, to the geez. Europeans. You know, <laughs> they just they drove all the you know all the jeeps and 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 vans and everything. They just threw it into the ocean. <laughs> oh <laughs> my than, goodness! Rather than <laughs> let the British and French. Well, they couldn't they couldn't take it back with them because it because it would have affected the there was so much that it would have affected the value that was so that was part of the reason why they couldn't take it back was they didn't want to devalue. You know, they, they if there was a glut of all this. You know. Know, all, all this so so is that or give it to the, the them for for free which wasn't going to happen but if you scuba dive there you can you can you can scuba dive into the jeeps and sit in the jeep and you know with your hands on the steering wheel and stuff in the, in the water and stuff because they've got like amazing scuba diving there and stuff <laughs> um so so yeah so it's kind of it's kind of interesting and stuff so so um so the british and french continued their oppressive regime and then the the americans you know came back and and managed to uh uh, they, they gave uh, one of the the tribal leaders who hadn't been imprisoned uh, an American flag and told them to to you know raise the flag and that America would have their back and you know the British and French saw the American flag and were incensed and asked them where he got it how they could put this you know foreign nation's flag up on their their island and and, and the Americans intervened and eventually negotiated uh, you know getting the British and French to back off and allowed them to to free their tribal. You know, leaders, and so they raise the American flag on the island every day, and uh, um, and and the, and every and and the anniversary, February fifteenth, of the release of the tribal leaders. They have you know all the tribes come together and do dances, and the highlight is uh, when uh, these uh, select men about 200 of them paint usa on their chest and back and they walk around with bamboo poles and do these uh these these remarkable in-step precision military uh marches um you know as as part of this this ceremony in front of you know the, the american flag and and it's uh it's it's amazing and uh, it's uh it's it's trippy and it's 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 really uh it, it's heartwarming you know seeing you know the the, the results of american policy done right uh you know that is amazing too, and I was going to ask you about uh, Vanuatu. Is it like considered a capitalist, um, you know, country, or would you call it like, it was it like a democrat or socialist or communist, or what would you consider like along those, um, you know, political and social lines for uh, Vanuatu? You know, it, it's democratic with an ac- with an asterisk. You know, it's you know you, you don't you know very few places. You know, despite a lot of the rhetoric today, very few places, including Europe, are as free as the United States. You know, there, there there's there's a lot of restrictions. You know, the the, the, the government has some. Pa- you know, it, it's democratic, but the, the the government has 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 a bit more power than you know than than what we're we're used to and experience. Mm-hmm. Um, I- that that's amazing yeah. too, and as, and speaking of political and social climates, as discussed, we'll talk about um, the Gilligan Manifesto along those lines. Listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the Mike Wagner Show dot com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit our line at sonicwebstudios dot com for all your needs. Looking for a professional website without breaking your budget? Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. That's one eight hundred three zero three three nine six zero. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the Mike Wagner Show.com. You can also check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download 
download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, also on Radio Public, Anchor FM, and watch the interview on The Mike Wagner Show on YouTube and subscribe to The Mike Wagner Show and take The Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with Kevin Selling, the uh, owner of Spectacle Films and Zemu Records, works as writer, director, producer, artist, and academic. He's produced um, such works like A Hole in the Head, which uh, was broadcast on Discovery and the Learning Channel. Also, You're in Good Health, Mr. Kevin and the Cargo Cult. He's also produced um, Icklin, The War on Kids, The War on the War on Drugs, Relax is Just Sex, Boris the Dog, and more. And we're going to get to the most recent work called The Gilligan Manifesto, a reflection of political and social climate in the early 60s, which is during the Cold War. Gilligan's Island depicted Americans in an analog of a post- apoplectic world where survivors must rebuild civilization and they create a communist paradise so um maybe you can just uh tell us a little bit about that little buddy a skipper would say <laughs> well you kind of you kind of shared it all but um no uh so so basically yeah i i I'm, I'm a huge fan of gilligan's island i just i just loved the show and and uh, at some point it came out in in reruns and and i would just sort of uh you know deconstruct the show for whoever was around and and uh yeah, and one of my friends told me, you know, you, you really should write this down. And, and it never really occurred to me how, how you know, uh, you know, that my interpretation was, you know, I, I guess it was so evident to me that I was surprised that, you know, that others couldn't couldn't quite see or perceive it. But but basically, you know, you have this show that that it, it first the, the, the pilot of the show was actually filmed, or, you know, literally the day that uh, or the day after uh, JFK was assassinated. Oh, I remember and, and, that. Yes, that was sad, JFK. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and and if you look at the uh, the opening, you know, footage of you know the 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 SS Minnow going out into the water, you can see there there are some flags, and the flags are at half mast because of because of the Kennedy assassination. Uh, so that's kind of dark and trippy and weird, but uh, but it also puts things into into perspective as far as uh, the timing. So so you have this this TV show that that you know, came out during, the, you know, what was pretty much the height of the Cold War, right after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, I, I think a lot of people at the time suspected that, that Castro or, or perhaps, you know, Russia or someone might be, had been involved with, with, with the assassination. So there was, you know, certainly a lot of tension there. Uh, but, but here you have, you have at, you know, the, this, this height of tensions of, you know, with, with the Soviet Union. And, and the, one of the most popular TV programs depicted seven Americans Living in in a post-apocalyptic society, and 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 by that it's it's the shipwreck and and the storm that shipwrecked them was was an analog for for nuclear annihilation because this was this was big on on everyone's everyone's heads. They were they were thinking about what if there's nuclear war and how how will I survive and and you know how, and and so people had bomb shelters in their home that was you know fairly common in in suburbia to at least you know consider it and 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 many people certainly had it or or some some approach. So, so there was a, there was a, a, a great interest in, in surviving or how one would survive a nuclear war, and and so you know so on a visceral level, people knew that that the storm, that the shipwreck, and and this you know primitive conditions um, uh, were were basically kind of you know the notion of, of of how how do these people survive you know what is you know nuclear nuclear annihilation and and what do they do? They build a society. That's pure communist, and that's what's the most mind-blowing thing. And not only do they build a society that 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 adheres to you know to pure Marxist communism, but the conflicts in a lot of the episodes, if you watch them, uh, some vestige of of democratic capitalism is is introduced uh, because it's kind of what they know, and it ends up leading to chaos. And 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 the the conflicts in each of the episodes, you know, is commonly from from a result of of some. Uh, of some vestige of 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 you know them trying to impose democracy in into the into the society, which you know, leads to this this destabilization, and it has to be removed by the end of the episode for for harmony to to be restored, where communism prevails in the end of every episode, and in order for there to be this this social cohesion. Mm -hmm. That's amazing too. It goes from a three-hour tour to being there for three years, and um, makes you wonder too. Um, were you actually glad they left the island to uh, get back to society, or were you just kind of sad? You wish they kind of stayed around a little longer. Well, as far as the show is concerned, they never, you know, they were stuck on the island. The show was actually picked up for 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 a fourth season, but not by CBS. It was uh, uh, it, the show was 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 set to be renewed. 
And the wife of Bill Paley, the president of CBS, was upset that Gunsmoke was going to be canceled in the next season. And she insisted that Gunsmoke not be canceled. And so someone had to, or either Gunsmoke or Bonanza, I think it was Gunsmoke. Uh, and, and so someone had to take the axe because the wife of the president didn't want her favorite show to be you know, canceled. And so Gilligan's Island was canceled. But but it was still going to survive because another station was going to pick it up because it was a very popular show. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but th- they destroyed the props before the other before the other network. Uh, I think it, so. It was on CBS. I think ABC was going to pick it up, and and the, but the props were destroyed before before uh, you know before word got out that ABC was going to take it over. So so it was it was prematurely canceled and uh, you know they never got off the island there was no real final episode there were you know there were three movies that were made afterwards you know where they got rescued and stuff but those you know I, I wouldn't consider those part of the canon of Gilligan's Island mm-hmm. <laughs> if and, you want to be a purist right. and, and and what are some of the things that stood out in your mind when it came to Gilligan uh, Island Manifesto it's like you know what really stood out in your mind and uh, what was like strong that when you um had, had produced is like was like the most strongest theme that that so, just really so, got instilled in you. Yeah, so 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 you know the movie's just the Gilligan Manifesto, which is you know a play on the Communist Manifesto, and um th- there were there were a few episodes. There's one where uh, they don't have any leader on the island because they don't need a leader, and and that kind of comes out. And there's a dispute where where the skipper thinks he's the leader, and Mister Howell you know insists that he is. Um, and you know, some would argue that you know, you know, others are, but uh, uh, so so they decide, yeah, but they don't they don't need a leader. <laughs> you know, you know, it was, it's a okay, little buddy. <laughs> so so they end up having an election for president, and uh, and and Gilligan is is depicted as someone who's who can't even tie his own shoelaces, and uh, but he ends up winning the presidency. So now so now they have this person who is you know who's you know quite incompetent who's who's the the president and the the social contract for democracy is that it doesn't matter how inept or incompetent your leader is you you, you have an agreement that you have to adhere to to the rules of, de- of democratic capitalism of democracy where where this person is your leader even if it means you know as it would on an island you know potentially your your doom um you know if they're, if they're truly that <laughs> that incompetent and and what happens? So so now they all accept that Gilligan is their president, but they all want positions in 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 the cabinet because they know if they get a position, Secretary of Labor, the Chief Justice, you know, Vice President, whatever it is, they know as they won't have to work. That being you know being an elected leader means that you don't have to 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 to, to expend any labor. And and so it's it's already you know just a seething indictment of of of, of you know of our of our democracy. And you know so they all get positions and none of them want you know none of them work and everything you know kind of falls apart and actually the only person who's, who ends up working is is gilligan and uh, but no one will assist him because they've all got positions in his cabinet and so so that's that's one example i think the best example though is uh they uh they decide uh gilligan is 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 digging doing a project for for mr howell and he stumbles on a on a on a chest and it looks like a treasure chest but it's locked and and there's a dispute over who owns it does gilligan own it because uh he he was doing the digging or does mr howell own it because he was sort of employing gilligan you know to to do the work he wasn't paying gilligan but he had requested gilligan so 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 they can't decide who who owns it so they decide to set up a legal system with with mr uh the professor acting as judge and and there's a there's a philosopher Ivan Ilyich, who says that uh, the systems create the, the 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 dysfunctions that they're supposed to cure. So uh, basically, hospitals make people sick, and in this case, you see not everyone. Obviously, some people can be sick regardless, but 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 the institutions breed the 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 illness, and and it's perfectly illustrated here because they create a a, a justice system, and and within you know minutes, everyone is suing one another. They're suing one another for for you know libel or or you know, uh, you know, false accusations and you know all sorts of things. So so suddenly that you know the professor has seven cases on his on his docket when he's just supposed to be making a decision on who owns this uh, you know this chest. Yeah, and uh, 
the professor ends up giving the ruling, and the ruling is perfectly consistent with communism, that uh, everything on the island belongs to all of them, and that includes the chest, all the resources, everything, and because they're communists, the chest doesn't belong to Gilgan or the Howells, it belongs to everyone, and... Uh, you know, and that was the decision that makes it quite clear that this this is a show about communism. Now, now if you're involved in that scenario, would you agree with that decision or not? It's the correct decision for the island, absolutely, yes. It, it, you know, I, just because communism works on an island of seven people uh, doesn't mean that communism works, you know, in, in, a, in, a, you know, in, in a situation mm-hmm. where there are more than seven people. Right, right, exactly. That's what I'm trying to get at. But if you were involved... Would you agree with that decision? Why or why not? Oh, oh, oh! It's it's definitely the right decision, and and it's it's the right decision. Like I said, because you're dealing with seven people, and uh, you know there there are, there are different rules, you know, with different numbers of people. It really it it does change things uh, because you know with seven people, everyone's voices, you know, can, everyone's voice can be heard. Uh, everyone is becomes an individual. That's part of you know the the consequence that they advertise in terms of communism on on the show is that all all these people you know except for the proletariat the only people who are named are are Gilligan and Marianne the other ones and they're the proletariat they're the working class everyone else is 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 defined there by their profession the millionaire the skipper the professor you know the movie star none, mm-hmm. none of them have identities ah but on the island. They actually become fully developed, fully realized people. They become human beings, and they, you know, they have to, you know, engage in labor. And it's, you know, through, you know, through through the contributions of their labor to the society, you know, you know, from 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 their abilities to 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 the need. That's you know the fundamental of communism. They they become whole people. Mr. Howell, in particular, you see him transform from, you know, from this this capitalist to, you know, to to a human being who's appreciated and loved. Uh, as an individual by the others uh, on on the island and and that's you know sort of a testament to you know to to you know the the, the advertisement of communism on the show um but it's uh you know just because it works in a in a fiction fantasy world of right, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that hey, hey, <laughs> yeah hey, exactly that's what makes me think of too and of course based on the gilgan's island manifesto what countries do you think would exactly fall into this uh, Gilligan's Island Manifesto. What countries would that remind you of? Well, 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 none except, but but not totally none. I, I'd say you know the Bushmen of the Kalahari, you know, have have basically a communist society. I'd, I'd say there are, there are a number of of tribal uh, societies that that lean toward communism. Many of the tribal you know lot societies have chiefs, um, but the chiefs, you know, it's it's their goal to distribute resources among the people fairly and evenly. So they're kind of a facilitator of of, of a kind of communism. Uh, so so I, I'd say in 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 a, in a society where uh, resources are homogeneous, you know, they might still be scarce, but but you don't have diversity among resources, and and where and, and where you have a society of of no more than you know than you know, a certain number of people, there's a threshold, you know, I don't know what that threshold is, you know, a couple hundred, maybe, maybe less, maybe 80. But but beyond that, you know, I, I think you're, it's it's not going to, it's not going to work. And, and of course, based on the characters of Gilgan's Island as well, too, what were leaders would, would fit well with the characters? What world leaders? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or world, or, you know, world leaders, world politicians, or somebody in power, like, say, you know, the queen or president of Venezuela, Japan, or Germany, the king and queen of England, or something, or even but our, I, I even think, our president. I think, I think all the characters are so fundamentally likable and have such good hearts, uh, that, that tragically it's hard to, uh, uh, to associate them with, with any, any contemporary world mm-hmm. leaders. Uh, you know, of, of any political, you know, <laughs> persuasion. So that's that's a neutral statement. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I can't really, uh, I can't really think of any. I think, you know, like I said, and and, and there, there's certain, you know, and there's something very innocent about them as well. Um, you know, in a cartoonish kind of way, you know, caricaturish right. way that they're, you know, they're they're, they're innocence. Um, and and then you know, there's certainly one of the the things that. Uh, uh, is a confounding factor in terms of applying anything realistically. Is there's no there's no sex on the island, mm-hmm. so uh, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. That's another part we'll get to as well too. We get to about uh, one of the tribes. I mean, just a fascinating idea. Of course, Gilligan's Island Manifesto. Where can they find that? 
Oh, so so Amazon Prime or uh, you know on, online it should be you know pretty much you know all all the online you know uh, sources uh, as far as as far as viewing it had been in theaters uh, and now and now it's you know a digital so it's just uh, the Gilligan Manifesto okay. um, and it's very funny so it's like there's a lot of clips from the show in there it's not all you know uh, this philosophizing and stuff like that and there's also some funny uh, footage uh, showing. The, the prevalence of, of that uh, theme of, of the fear of of, uh, uh, of the apocalypse of nuclear <laughs> annihilation. I, I think that's been very prevalent, too. We'll talk about um, a similar tribe you're talking about. We'll talk about um, one of the whole sex things. You listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the MikeWagnerShow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit our line at SonicWebStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without break your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that below the competition Way. Call today at 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on themikewagnershow.com. You can check our Facebook page at facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Also on Radio. Public and Anchor FM and watch the interview on the YouTube channel on the Mike Wagner Show. Subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show on YouTube and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with Kevin Selling, President of Spectacle Films, Zemo Records, and he recently released Gilligan's Island Manifesto. We talked about that and um, the intricacies of the show, the tribal and everything else with the uh, political and social climate. And speaking of political and social climate, so you also produced and directed Ickland, a film by the tribe in northern Uganda, described as the most despicable people on the planet by an anthropologist, studied him over 40 years ago. You can just uh, tell us all about that. Okay, yeah, so there was this anthropologist who's uh, Colin Turnbull, who's very, very well respected. He uh, graduated from, from Oxford University where he got his PhD, became a uh, uh, director of Af- African ethnology at the Museum of Natural History uh, in, in New York. Uh, so, you know, a, a major figure. And uh, he, he had uh, studied the pygmy tribe and wrote this book called The Forest People. He, he, he absolutely loved the pygmy, thought they were, they were amazing. And uh, then he goes off to, uh, to northern Uganda to, to, to study this tribe called the Ik. Um, and uh, there's, there's, some, there's been some effort to, like, uh, I, I noticed when I was, like, doing my research and I went to, you know, Museum of Natural History and talked to other anthropologists and others, and they were all referring to them as the Eek, E-E-E-K. Uh, but the ick call themselves the ick. You know, I asked the ick. <laughs> they, they, they call themselves they call themselves ick. Um, so so, uh, so they might want to call them ick, but that's not what they're calling themselves. But um, uh, but but the, the, yeah, when Turnbull was there, he he was there for for roughly three years, and and he just had a terrible time. And uh, he he just described them as as the most despicable people. He he said that there's just there's no joy, there's no love among the the ick that they uh, they they exploit one another. Uh, children will steal food from the elderly. Parents will 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 starve their kids to death. They'll they'll uh, they, they don't sing. They don't dance. Um, the uh, the only you know uh, recreation is is Schadenfreude, which is you know they basically the only time they laugh is at the misfortune of one another. And to that end, their recreation is creating misfortune for one another. And since they don't have much, they they would uh, allegedly defecate in front of one another's huts for the you know for the pleasure of making one another miserable. Um, and and I, so so the, the the book when it came out it was called the Mountain People uh, came out in I think 1972 and um, there there had been this this hippie philosophy that still persisted around that time and and it was basically adopted from Rousseau who was this uh, French philosopher who basically said that man at his core is is good and it's society uh, that uh, creates competition that turns you know man against man. And if, if, you know, that, that, that the core of man, if we can just, you know, get beyond that is, is, is fundamentally good. And, and here was, you know, basically it was considered that tribal societies, which were free from, you know, the, the, uh, um, the pressures of capitalism and, and the competition, you know, there was the expectation is that they, they should be, you know, noble and, and uh, treat one another well. And, and here was this depiction of these people that was, you know, just savage and brutal. Um, so it was, it was a very, very disturbing and shocking book when it came out because it, you know, undermined that, that, that whole philosophy. 
and uh, th there was a uh, there was a biologist who wrote this book that was sort of called Lives of a Cell, and uh, he he was commenting on on the book and was saying that uh, you know that oh you can't really use this as an example. Um, uh, because basically he was saying that, that, that each member of the ick has, has become a nation and this is how, how nations treat one another and that it's not really representative of, of people at their core. Uh, but the article was only three pages long and because it was three pages long, it was used as a reading exercise when I was in junior high. And when you're in junior high and you read about tribes taking craps in front of one another's huts, it's the funniest thing in the world. Uh, so, so it stuck with me and I was like, you know, I wonder if you know what it would be like to to track these people down. You know, twenty, thirty years later, however many years it was after, you know, twenty years later. I don't know. After being in junior high, and uh, I, I I had this crazy idea, but and and in, you know the the internet was was didn't have any information on them. And when I was showing the article to people, you know, most people thought, well, this is a joke because it was so extreme. If you read it, it's pretty funny. And, and they were <laughs> uh -huh. they were thinking like this is just fiction, you know, kind of you know. But then you know, I, after doing a bit of research, I found out no, these these people are real. But the problem is, northern Uganda is uh, is a really 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 dangerous place that's really really hard to get to uh, because uh, the, at that time the Lord's Resistance Army. Uh, was you know had this the the the, the child soldiers and uh, was just uh, um, just just brutalizing uh, the north and if you managed to get past them to the very north uh, you had the uh, Turkana and the Karamoja which are these two uh, warring tribes that uh, uh, walk around pretty much naked except for you know they've got scarification and you know some have uh, lip plugs and some of the traditional things but they 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 carry uh, AK-47s and uh, and, and bandoliers of bullets, uh, so it's it's pretty scary and dangerous. And they're cattle raiders, and uh, you know they will indiscriminately shoot people just for you know giggles. Mm -hmm. So um, so so dodging them as well as the terrain, which is just you know unbelievably unforgiving and harsh, and and wild animals and insects and snakes and and stuff. It was it was a huge mistake going there. <laughs> but, uh, oh man. Yeah, and and I mean, but it was I mean, every day, without exception, every day there was something new, harrowing, and horrible that I can't believe I I survived in retrospect, and uh, I still periodically get nightmares uh, from from my time there. I mean, we were uh, we we could drive just so far, then we had to hike because uh, I mean, we were driving on dry riverbeds. But uh, uh, there was one there was one place where where there was a, a, an ambush set for us, and we were ordered out of our vehicle at gunpoint. You know, myself, the cameraman, and and the crew. And we were marched into, you know, into the woods where they, where they were, you know, going to, to shoot and kill us and, and take our stuff. But um, I I'd taken a Polaroid camera and I, you know, right when they uh, had taken us, you know, told us to get out of our, our vehicle, I'd taken a, a Polaroid of them. And they didn't know from cameras or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no there's no technology up there other than guns. And um and so I, the, the, I basically taken the photo so so there'd be some record of the people that murdered us. Um, and, oh uh, my! But uh, you know, but by the time we, you know, we were marched into the bush and you know where they were going to, you know, off us, the 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 film, you know, the photo had mostly dried, hadn't completely dried, but was you know dry enough that you could make out you know the images, and they they had never seen themselves, they had no idea what they looked like which is kind of mind blowing, you know, to think about, you know, they'd never seen themselves, you know, maybe reflection in water, but it's not, not quite the same. And so they, they, you know, but they, they, they recognized themselves because they knew that it had to be them. And they, they were, they were, they, they were actually starting to laugh hysterically. They were pointing at one another and they were just laughing. And we just kind of, you know, made our way back to our vehicle while they were laughing at the photo. And so entranced by it and, and stuff. So yeah, Polaroid saved our, saved our lives. And, uh, I mean, but every every day it was something horrible, and it was that that was just one day. I mean, like you know, there was another day. Lions descended on our campsite, and you know, we just were cowering in our tents while lions were circling for four hours. And and you know, another time we were camped out in a place where where the villagers, the Dodoth tribesmen, had anthrax. Um, uh, yeah, it was it was it was just a bad time uh, until until we got to the ick. The ick themselves were wonderful. That that was you know, the people who were supposed to be the most horrible were were great, and they did sing and they did dance and and. Turnbull was, uh, you know, was was not quite factual, um, which is unfortunate in terms. I mean, it's fortunate for the people, but it's not fortunate for you know mm -hmm. uh, academic truth. But 
But it did win some awards, too, at the uh, Boston International Film Fest. Oh, yeah. Great yeah, reviews yeah. in the New York Times, Discovery yeah. Magazine, and everything. So yeah. something did good, good come off it, and irregardless, <laughs> who really gives a crap, as they say? <laughs> <So>. Well, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, I'm glad I made the film, and I'm glad I was able to redeem the reputation, uh, you know, to, to those who were aware that the reputation had been, you know, smirched <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and of course speaking of wars and everything else we'll talk about a couple of war movies listen to the mike wagner show at the mike wagner show.com powered by sonic web studios visit online at sonic web studios.com for all your needs look at a professional website without breaking your budget sonic web studios is the answer sonic web studios offers fast affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away call today at 1-800-303-3960 that's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. You can check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can also download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, as well as um, Radio, Repu- Radio Public and Anchor FM. Also, watch the interview on the YouTube channel, subscribe to The Mike Wagner Show, and take The Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with Kevin Selling, the president of Spectacle Films and Zemu Records. He also produced the uh, Gilligan's Allen Manifesto. We talked about that. We also talked about some of the uh, other movies involving political and social climate and also tribes as well, too. Now let's get to the war and a couple of things like the war on kids and the war on the war on drugs. You guys had um, won quite numerous awards, and uh, you can just... Tell us all about that. What inspired you guys to do it? Oh, those are two very different movies, but I, I guess maybe there's similarities in some ways. So, so the war on the war on drugs uh, was was a movie that came out, you know, a while back at the you know the onset, well, a little past the onset of the drug war. But it was it, it was when the propaganda machine had had really stepped up, and and I, I found that to be just one of the worst casualties. You know, they would say like the you know the worst casual or the first casualty of war was truth. And, and and it's not that there aren't you know dangers with with taking you know uh, illegal drugs, but it, when they're exaggerated and, and you know then everything becomes a lie and no one believes everything. But it also affects you know our our our, our trust for the government. And when the government is 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 you know putting investing in a propaganda machine as opposed to informing its people, I found that to be uh, profoundly undermining. Faith in government, the role of government, uh, its trust in its people. It's, you're supposed to have a democracy, and you have such contempt for your own people that you think the only way to, you know, provide public health is is to lie to them. Uh, so, so it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was an angry piece. But it was, it was, you know, the funny thing about the film was that it was a comedy. So it was, it was basically making fun of all the the anti drug uh, propaganda that was out at the time by showing, uh, you know, spoofs of them by showing. Uh, just how how perverted their their the logic was of what they were you know showing, um, and uh, you know they, they, it would just be these these outrageous anecdotal scenarios or something you know or or profound exaggerations, and, and so I was just showing how the same uh, you know the same type of you know bad logic could be used to to promote drugs, and. Um, it, it was a comedy, but it it was somehow treated by everyone as a documentary, which I find hilarious. Um, Almost a reverse psychology. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was. It was considered a documentary. It was distributed by you know by Warner, you know, so it was like it got major distribution and and stuff. But but they stocked it on they 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 stocked it on the on the shelves as documentary. It was listed as documentary. It won uh, best documentary uh, for from High Times magazine, which you know that that at least is sort of funny and and, and uh, you know <laughs> yeah they, they, High Times has this thing called the Stony Award uh, for and and, and and it didn't win for best movie or best comedy or it went for documentary, which which is which is you know yeah I I I, I don't know what to make of that, but it's 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 kind of hilarious. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, you know, the War on Kids was was a very different movie, and that was sort of a movie that was, you know, I felt I was born to make, and it was uh, 
uh, it deals with the American school system, and uh, it, it was uh, I started work on it just as there was the the rise in zero tolerance, and uh, it was it was this awareness that the same generation, that hippie generation, that had fought so hard for you know marching for civil rights, you know had had become fundamentally fascist. And uh, that that the generation that that you know had had called for all this was now instigating the worst abuses in 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 compulsory schooling, um, you know that that you know America had ever seen in terms of uh, you know all all of its policy, one strike and you're out, and you know putting uh, resource officers, police officers, in schools and turning things that are 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 not even you know, not even crimes, yet somehow students could be arrested for them and put in jail. And even when, when you know, they were, you know, if, if they were wrong about things, it didn't matter. It was, you know, there was a kid, for instance, I mean, there was like thousands of these stories, but there was a child who, who had uh, lemon drops and it was a brand that they didn't, you know, recognize. And they were, you know, they thought maybe it was drugs. Uh, and of course it turned out it was candy, but, uh, but they, they, they upheld the, the, you know, going, you know, putting the, the expulsion and I think perhaps arrest on the grounds that, well, it could have been drugs. <laughs> and, 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 and there's just story after story of, of this kind of insane injustice and, you know, and then the cameras and the classrooms and the hallways and everywhere and the metal detectors and, you know, just treating like kids like, you know, criminals before they've, you know, j just for no reason, the pathologizing of, of youth where, uh, um, you know, where, where normal behavior is treated as, as something dysfunctional and having to drug them into submission. Uh, so, so that, that movie, you know, is, uh, is, is just a very angry piece about, uh, uh, just, just what's happened to schools and, uh, um, but, but I, I learned a lot more making that. I mean, I spent about eight or 10 years, uh, making that movie and, you know, I, I came to the appreciation realization that schools have always been bad and, uh, that they cannot be reformed and that they are fundamentally destructive and they do much more harm than good, um. And, and that was a disturbing realization. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also made some, uh, you know, really um, lighthearted ones, too, like Relax is Just Sex, starring Jennifer Tilly, Laurie Petty, Cindy Williams, Boris the Dog, which won the Primo Nouveau Award. And also, um, you also produced a Bill Johnson show and uh, The Summer of Hate involving the Beatles. And uh, maybe just uh, tell us briefly about that. So um, The Summer of Hate is what I'm working on right now. And... Uh, that's uh, that's a, a it's a dark movie, but it deals with uh, the summer of 1966, and it was at this time when the whole landscape of America, you know, had profoundly changed. You know, most people think of the 50s as one thing and the 60s as another. You know, if I just say the 50s and 60s, and you know, it, it evokes certain images in your head of, of what America was like. But 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 this, the the 60s really didn't start, didn't really become you know different from that image of of the 50s until uh, the Watts riots in 65, and by 60. Uh, you had like 12 or 13 race riots that year. You had um, the, the emergence of, of the celebrity uh, mass killer, um, Richard Speck, who, who murdered eight nurses in Chicago, and Charles Whitman, who, who gunned down 37 people in University of uh, Texas. Uh, before then, yeah, you, you had some mass killings, but you didn't really have, you know, the personality associated with it, which, you know, sort of imbued it with this whole other level of, of, of horror. Uh, you had the first uh, civil rights leader who was shot, uh, James Meredith, uh, marching uh, outside of Memphis. Uh, you had, uh, you know, the Vietnam protests uh, really first started that year. Uh, and then through it all, you have the Beatles touring the United States, and there's this backlash against the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And uh, at every show, the, the, the KKK was was rallying. Um, and the the theory is, you know, that most people think it was that the protests and the pushback against the Beatles at that time was uh, because of uh, John Lennon uh, making this comment about the Beatles being more popular than Jesus. I remember and, that. Yes. And and that wasn't the reason. I mean, it was it was hyped as, and it and it certainly you know built it. But it was it wasn't in and of itself. You know, without without corrupting the context, it wasn't a controversial statement in and of itself at the time because um, religion in general at that time in in history was had gone through a decline. There was just a lot less interest in 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 religion. Mm -hmm. Society had become more secular, and and there was a lot of concern among the churches. You know, how do how do we get people back? How do we respond to this? So so. It wasn't it wasn't a radical statement and, and Lennon wasn't saying that the Beatles were better and there was no way to really cons you know no one would have construed that from the statements if, 
if a couple of DJs in Alabama hadn't uh, hadn't made it sound like that's what Lenin was saying. But what was really being pushed back against was uh, had to do with race and. Um, it was uh, McCartney was uh, really taking the lead there and had been decrying uh, racism in the United States and segregation. Well, the Beatles were united on that. And during their 64 tour, the Beatles said, and this was their first tour of America. You know, they didn't know if they were going to be around for th- for another week because, you know, that was sort of how things went with bands. They were not around for very long. They'd be big, you know, one day and gone the next. And right. they said there was no way they were going to play a segregated venue. And lo and behold, Tallahassee, Florida, which was scheduled on their tour, was segregated. And the Beatles said, there's no way we're going to play a segregated venue. And so there was a lot, you know, as they're going through their dates, you know, the the, the press are saying, you know, are you going to play Tallahassee? And the Beatles are like, no, we're not. And uh, Tallahassee backed down and agreed to desegregate. And uh, the Beatles also refused to play at segregated hotels. Well, uh, even though it was... Um, this this sent you know shockwaves out to to the community and little lesser venues desegregated because the main venue desegregated. But there was an op ed that came out at the time in Tallahassee was you know who who are these people these foreigners you know coming in these interlopers trying to tell us you know what we you know how we should live and they didn't mention the desegregation but it was all very clear that this is what it was about mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, and and it put all these other venues on notice that oh, you know, the Beatles are going to come back obviously in '65, and if you want the Beatles, you got to desegregate, and 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 so it 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 really you know sent out you know a message, and the Beatles were 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 not just instrumental in in their you know in supporting the movement, they were directly instrumental in a lot of the desegregation that took place in the United States, and. <coughs> And this was an opportunity for backlash. And uh, the way it was instigated was there was a um, uh, there was Teen Book magazine. Uh, the editor in chief had uh, sent had licensed these interviews with the Beatles. One was the one where, where Lennon made his his Jesus comment, but another right. was was McCartney saying it's a lousy country where anyone who's black is called a dirty N word. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this was the cover of the magazine as a headshot of Paul. That headline on the top of it, the DJ, you know, was was you know annoyed at the South for you know for you know perpetuating segregation and stuff, and he said, you know, hey, we know you DJs like the Beatles. Look, look what they think about you know your your sorry people, and uh, sent this advance copies you know to them, and uh, they thumbed through the issues and found Lennon's statement, and you know, because right, they weren't going to deal or address you know race issues, so they right. they went all over that and. Uh, and, and that was how it started. But the very first place to burn the records was right outside Tallahassee. It oh, oh, wasn't in Al- wasn't in Alabama. It was outside Tallahassee. I, I was going to mention something about that statement with John Lennon. And uh, there was a couple of reports out there, especially for one of my professors back up in Illinois. He said that the reason why John Lennon made that statement is because he was getting tired or they were getting tired of being worshipped over Jesus Christ. And people were just worshipping the wrong things. He said that out of sarcasm. He's like... We're getting tired of being worshipped. That's that's what it sounded like. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but he but he made the statement like uh, sarcasm. It's like, oh, we're just tired of tired of being worshipped over Jesus. I don't know if I'm well, right well, or not. Well, there, there there is a lot of truth to that. In that, um, one of the things that started happening on the later tours was um, a, a lot of people, you know, who had you know disabilities and and other kinds of, of ailments. Uh, were were brought to the front and and were brought up to the Beatles in the hopes that if they they touched the Beatles you know that they they would you know hopefully be cured and and so this was this these were the people the Beatles were being paraded you know seeing these 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 tragic desperate people who who you know were very unfortunate but but this was like you know this was the Beatles tour now they would barely get you know they would be paraded among these people and and they knew they didn't have any special powers and and yet you know how how do you respond how do you how do you act you know when when a you know person who's who's in a very unfortunate situation is is you know uh, you know is is paraded there so yeah it's um uh, so so yeah a lot of what you're saying there was this 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 belief that they had some some aura some religious aura and stuff to them so yeah it's uh it, yeah, it's just sat all around. It, it was almost taken out of context. Like he said, we're just tired of being followed around. It was just like, come on, stop following us. It's like, you know, how the hordes of girls, you know, come over like screaming and they have to 
run for well, their I lives think, practically. So it's just like well, I think they liked some of that. They probably <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It, well, that's exactly it. And when is that going to come out? Since you're working on it, um, probably probably in uh, a year or two. You know, documentaries take a long time, but uh, um, you know, probably a year or two it'll it'll be done. But it's it's it's. It, it's going to be it's going to be a very interesting movie because like there, there's a lot of movies you know that are histories and you might see a movie you know in the history of '66 or the '60s or something and you'll see a movie on on the Beatles uh, and the history there but you'll never see the two laid over you'll never know that like when John Lennon you know and the Beatles first came to uh, uh, Chicago which was the first stop I mean they flew into New York and then they flew straight to Chicago where uh, they do the press conference where where Lennon sort of apologizes in a way you know for the statement and. Uh, and it's one thing to know that it's another thing to know that that there was race riots going on in Chicago, you know, that lasted a week and only ended like two days before. Or, or Richard Speck, you know, the Speck had just killed all the, these people right there. I mean, just you know, when you see the turmoil that's all taking place, you know, as a backdrop to what's going on with the Beatles and stuff, it it just it it creates a whole a whole different story and it makes something very interesting. And you never see the two you know, laid over one another when the Beatles had all these death threats and bomb threats at their various shows, you know, to know that, that, uh, various, you know, major figures had just been shot, you know, right in that very same city, uh, that they're performing in. It, it, it gives it a whole other, you know, gravity and, uh, you know, changes, you know, how, how these events look and feel. That is amazing too. We'll talk about the other movies as well too. I'd like to have you back on, talk about, um, about about the Beatles and some other things and um you know in terms of her films and everything else you know developing a genre and everything who to consider your um your favorite directors or say your favorite actors or even like you know singers and everything else uh, that influenced your career or shaped it um wow that's tough to say i um yeah a film i i got into you know, sort of, sort of, you know, like I described with 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 Hole in the Head, it was sort of accidental in the sense that it was uh, a, a way to explore academic subjects or 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 other creative things like like my animation. Um, and th- there are people who are who have real encyclopedic knowledge of 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 films, and I have that with music. Um, I I you know with with rock music, I I can tell you who played and what and when for how long and what charted and you know everything about histories of of every band and people can do that with with film and i, I could i could bluff and fake my way through it but i'd rather <laughs> you know I'd, I'd rather not i mean you know there there are a few you know there, there are certainly some people that i like but i just, i i don't feel like my my opinion about uh, directors and and actors is uh is is any more telling than anyone else's where where my feelings about music i think are 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 educated and sophisticated where i would insist that I have more of a right to, to, to say certain things about certain you know artists and, and producers and, and music but but film I feel like my, my opinion doesn't mean anything more than than anyone than any other you know person who enjoys you know who enjoys movies that is amazing too Kevin and uh, just a couple of uh, more things here before we uh, let you go we know you're a very busy guy and getting back to the Beatles and everything what do you consider your most favorite project and the most challenging Wow um, you know, if you ask any any creative person what their favorite thing is, they're they're always going to say their current project, whatever they're whatever they're involved in at the moment, and and that's that's the answer that that should be because if you're not trying to outdo yourself and what you did, then you're stagnating, you know. So I, so I have to say, you know, the summer of hate is is my favorite because it's what I'm working on now, um, you know, in terms of in terms of film. I mean, most challenging, hands down, was 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 going to Uganda and. Uh, uh, and getting shot at by the LRA and and uh, ambushed and other stuff. I mean, it was they, you know that was just harrowing and brutal and uh, you know and and you know risking my life on a, on a daily basis and and just coming at some point to coming to terms that that there's a good chance I, I will not go home and and to just just accept and deal with that that you know one of those days will be my last and because because the anxiety and the fear was was just too much to bear. And it's like if I just didn't come to 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 accept that that I was probably going to die, I you know it just that you know the fear would have just just I wouldn't have been able to to, to exist. And it, was, it wasn't going to help. So that so so the Ickland by far was was the most challenging, uh, but. Um, uh, War on Kids has has a certain special place in my heart because it's it is uh, it, it is something that uh, um, is uh, um, 
you know, I, 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 from you know a social, you know, from a civil rights issue. It's you know, youth are 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 have, are the the most neglected population in terms of that. Every every group has been fighting for rights in some capacity, but whatever group that you think is the most oppressed, and I, I don't care which one you 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 pull out of a hat. Their children, the children of those people, are going to be the most oppressed because, you know, whatever whatever people are the most oppressed, their children are oppressed by everyone else and their parents, you know, and and the society. So so the children always have it have it the worst, and and it's you know it's neglected and 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 just how bad schools are is is something that you know everyone you know people went through and then they quickly forgot. You know, they only remember you know the the, the moments that you know where they they endured and survived and even have you know somehow will happy memories because you just don't remember the boredom and and the injustices but you know but the film does jar people you know a after the screenings of war on kids everyone comes up to me and tells me of, of of their unconscionable injustice that they you know that they had suppressed that that they experienced that was the hallmark of their youth uh and then as far as uh um, artistically, the Gilligan Manifesto, I'd say, from you know, so far anyway, is 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 my most elegantly constructed you know movie as as an artistic expression. That is amazing. Um, Once again, you can find Gilligan's Alan Manifesto at um, and on, uh, on the web, and he'll tell you about that. Who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Tom Lehrer. <laughs> Tom Lehrer. He was this um, uh, satirist, uh, singer, mathematician. Uh, he, uh, he, he did three albums in the, uh, you know, 1960, 61, 62. That was, you know, sort of as a joke and, and just, just brutal satire. Um, and, uh, very, very clever and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, he, he just played piano and sing and, and, um, he, he's, uh, uh, you know, he, 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 his, you know, defining quality was irreverence. And uh, e even when I would listen to him, I was very little because the songs were catchy, and I I knew there was something irreverent about it, even though I didn't, you know, under I was too little to understand a lot of the the things that he was commenting on. Um, but I, I I could still appreciate the irreverence to to what he was, you know, describing and discussing, and uh, and 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 he's very dark and very funny, and uh, uh, you know, it's certainly something I aspire to, and 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 clever and witty and and you know, are phenomenally articulate, and uh, you know. He's, uh, yeah, he's, he's remarkable. That's amazing, too. And just a couple more things. What's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Best advice I can give to anyone um, to, about anything? <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> whatever I want. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess, uh, I don't know, I'm going to, like, Bill and Ted be excellent to one another. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, eh, you know, I guess something to that effect. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, pursue, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, certainly, tr you know, pursue things that you're uh, interested in that are that are going to uh, Im improve the world and uh, try to uh, uh, try to try to maintain a good good spirit about things and, and don't, you know, don't hate everyone because they think differently unless they're being destructive, uh, you know. That is amazing, too. And, of course, um, just wanted to say, Kevin, thank you very much for your time. been fantastic. Kevin Soling, the um, producer and director of Gilligan's Island Manifesto, also president of Spectacle Films and Zemu Records, also with a number of um, award-winning documentaries, War on Kids, War and the War on Drugs, Eklund, and also um, Hole in the Head, and many, many more. Check out the uh, Gilligan's Island Manifesto. Tell everybody, once again, where you can find Gilligan's Island Manifesto. So uh, Gilgan Manifesto and other films can all be found on, on Amazon Prime, on YouTube, on iTunes, you know, pretty much all the, uh, you know, all, all, all the, uh, the online outlets. Uh, Hulu might have them, I'm not really sure, uh, but, but certainly, you know, definitely Amazon, definitely, uh, you know, YouTube and, and, and others. Uh, you, you can find it in you know most of those the digital mediums, and you can go to spectaclefilms.com. And if people still buy DVDs, uh, there are always DVDs for sale on Amazon and and spectaclefilms.com. So and, and tell yeah. everybody your upcoming projects, your website, and how do people contact you? So spectaclefilms.com. Uh, you can go there, and uh, you know that that should uh, there should be contact information there, and. Uh, well, I'm sorry. What was the other question? Was the the latest film, up, upcoming, upcoming projects, upcoming. and how do people contact you? Yeah. So upcoming film is uh, so so. Mr. Kevin and the Cargo Cult will be coming out 
uh, I think early next year. Uh, I'm still working on Summer of Hate, and people can go to uh, spectaclefilms.com and uh, spectaclefilms at gmail.com, or you know they can they can reach out uh, if they want. That is great. Okay, Kevin, just want to say you've been fantastic, and uh, I'm ready to go back to um, be with my little buddy Skipper and Gilligan's <coughs> Island. Thank you very much. You've been fantastic. Looking forward to ha- having you on again soon, and please do us a favor and keep us up to date. Absolutely. Thank you, and I, I appreciate all the time and interest and uh, you know, giving me this platform. Thanks for listening to the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. Also, become a sponsor of the program and or donate today at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of the Mike Wagner Show.